So for a long time, especially in psychology and in life sciences, um, people were just like, I, I would do a study, I would report whatever I want to report in a paper, and then I would send this paper to the publisher, and the publisher would say, neat, I'm going to publish this because this, this looks fine to me. I wouldn't tell you if I found things that are inconvenient uh, because I have my theory. Or if I found things that I didn't expect to find, I would be like, uh, I guess I planned this all along. This was all a part of my plan. I knew that like that this was, this was going to happen. So I come up with this ad hoc theory. But in reality, this was just a fluke. And no one is going to no replicate it. So people are going to base their work off of my fluke. Mm. And what's happened in the last maybe 10 or 15 years, I'd say 10 years, is that psychology is kind of like imploding because in 2011, a group of psychologists decided that they would replicate 100 of the canonical social psychology studies. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, 37 were replicated properly. So the majority were, oh, couldn't replicate. Wow. Yeah, so stuff like the most viewed TED Talk, at least at that time, was one by Amy Cuddy who is a social psychologist, and she looked into um, power poses. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about this. Right? Yeah, so that yeah, didn't yeah. replicate. It didn't replicate, that's no. right, yeah, the power pose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, so now what do we do? Like, you know, this is in so many books of like how to do well in a job interview and stuff yeah. like that. People were really like, this was changing people's lives. Did you lives. hear about that group of researchers who were uh, manipulating, getting their uh, research papers published? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's fucked. Yeah, this like the this this industry is messed up, and it's messed up because it's an industry. It it shouldn't be an industry, as you mentioned, incentive structures. Yeah, yeah, it's really really messed up. I agree, a hundred percent. There are some people that are trying to kind of uh, correct the way things are right now. Um, there's some interesting idea out there. There's uh, my colleague House Lin from uh, the University of Toronto has, I think, a really interesting idea of basically. I mean, I don't want to. Um, Miss uh, present his his uh, idea, but if I understand it correctly, it's um, you upload your paper, uh, and then people basically comment on it. Gotcha. And then you can upvote or downvote comments, um, and then you kind of you get currency within the system based on how much you upvote or yeah, downvote. Yeah, so it's, and a, how cur much it's you a curation type yeah. of list. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, but. I don't exactly know how expertise would play into that. That's a problem. Yeah. It's like, there's also, there's no skin in the game. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, so. I mean, I, the idea is that it would, it would all be public, so not anonymous. Yeah. So if I critique your work, then you know who said that your work is good or bad. Yeah. So there is some, like, reputation is everything. I think funding is a big problem, though. This is why I like open science, mm -hmm. where it's like, there's people in the crypto space or in the blockchain space trying to figure out crowdsourcing. Like, for me, it's a... Uh, um, I would, like the, right now, you know, there's one traditional way of of going through. You got to go through the red tape. You got to raise. I think people forget how expensive studies are. Absolutely, like it's expensive. It's, oh, yeah. it's not like you snap your fingers and like, oh, the study is done tomorrow. It's like there's a duration period dealing with humans. You got to mm -hmm. pay it out, and like the process is lengthy. And I, especially in the second, I, I think the. The people who want to see this succeed, not from a monetary gain, but from a beneficial human aspect of like, this is actual medicine that can help people. Mm -hmm. I think this might be kind of the stepping stone or catalyst to kind of launch this kind of movement of open science. Right. So I will say that I think that a lot of people in the psychedelic space are, I think they're pro open science mm -hmm. in theory, but they're not actually doing it. There's one guy I know who's um, in Amsterdam who actually ran a replication study of that uh, time dilation one, um, and he pre-registered his study, and he failed to replicate those results, by the, the way. LSD one. Yeah, yeah, that I mentioned before. Um, and when I saw his work, I was like, I'm blown away. You're the only other person in psychedelics who pre-registers. So he's a cool guy. I do not remember his name off the top of my head, but he's a grad student in Amsterdam, George something. But yeah, so I guess kind of like, Another response to just to, to describe the like open science for maybe people who are listening to this podcast who don't know. Um, so the idea is you pre-register all of your hypotheses. So you can't do this thing where you hide inconvenient results or you pretend to have known all along when you find really yeah, cool results. confirmation bias and all this other stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So you just say ahead of time, you say, here's what I'm going to do, A, B, C. And then when it's time to publish, you show the publisher. You say, I said I would do A, B, C. I did A, B, C. 
I wasn't planning on doing D, mm. but I'm saying that flat out. Like, I thought this would be cool, so I'm doing this now. Consider it exploratory. I don't know. This is cool. Someone else should replicate it, right? Um, so I love that. So we, we really, like, as our team really strongly believes in that, so we pre-register everything, and we also make our materials available. So you can, you can find our survey on our Open Science Framework website. All of what we did, you can find it. You can replicate our study using the exact same materials. Again, because we want uh, replication to be easy. And our data is also available online. So if we may have made mistakes in our statistical analysis, and if anyone wants to check it out, they can reproduce it. Um, so I think that's really cool. In terms of, uh, I, I also, I'm surprised to hear that uh, the um, crypto space is also involved in this. There's a lot of overlap between psychedelic people and crypto Yeah, I'm people. not surprised. So um, I'm kind of, I'm jumping the gun here. I don't exactly know when this will get published, but there's this company called Molecule. Um, I know the guys. They're so They cool. reached out to me, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. so nice guys, yeah, yeah. and they have a really cool idea. They want to, if I understand correctly, to like democratize drug development. Yes. Um, using blockchain technology. Yeah. Um, and so they reached out to us, and I think our project is going to be either their first, like their flag project, or one of the first projects that they're going to work with. So they're going to help raise funds for us. Um, and so it's been so, so far, it's been really cool working with them mm -hmm. because I, they're like, they're so on the level with open science. I dig that. Yeah, Molecule is doing a great job. Yeah, it's just uh, former guys from Uport, if I'm 